to the U.S. bishops. This is the mindset and the set of priorities that you need to have to fix the American church and the church in the world. You need a new modus operandi. That is, you need to act like kings. You need a new attitude. You need to be more negative. And you need new directions in the realms of morals and faith. Afterwards, we will go over particular objectives that need to be accomplished to effect these changes. First of all, a new modus operandi. Bishops of the Catholic Church, do you not know? You are kings. Just as the deacon fulfills the role of the prophet, preaching and justifying the listeners, and just as the priest fulfills the Old Testament role of the priest, sanctifying the listeners, therefore, you fulfill the role of the ancient Old Testament king, so act like kings. Do not act like sheep with herd mentality. Historically, in the early church, you all acted like kings. You were all equal with Peter in the lead, and it was charity that was the glue that bound you all together in one body as the soul of the church. Consequently, each of you had your own legislative, executive, and judicial powers as any king would. Any people then who would in conscience commit themselves to your rule were then given laws by you to better affect their salvation. With time, this became united in the councils in a body of canon law, which over time grew so powerful and so extensive that it subordinated you to itself so that you had to go through it in order to rule over your own people. This was to the advantage of Roman emperors and the Pope, but it meant that you became effective subsidiary CEOs rather than true kings of your people anymore. So the executive, judicial, and legislative powers were absorbed into canon law itself in the power of the Pope and eventually with time into his curia. This is all well and good as long as there is communion and charity between the members of the College of Bishops. But what happens when the Pope wishes to bring in non-bishops in the guiding of the church, taking over the legislative function? Or what happens when one bishop takes his diocese into schism? In the old days, it was very possible to just appoint a new bishop from above by the Pope, and then the people could voluntarily commit themselves to the bishop which their conscience indicated. And that was fine and very good, and an advantage to having the hierarchical system like this. But what happens if the Pope loses divine charity and sanctifying grace and becomes demonically possessed as all people who fall out of grace to some degree do? Well, in that case, canon law itself then is in the hands of an evildoer. What should be your response in this? Logically, you should reabsorb your kingly powers back into your own hands. Okay, but to be clear, I am not advocating for schism. Still less am I advocating for starting a Episcopal line from a schism, nor for contesting the primacy of Peter. None of these am I calling for. But what I am calling for is that if there are various appendages of Peter that he has used, equivalent to maybe like a hair shirt on the body of Christ, or some spike that he's wearing that is offending another part of the body, that you not cooperate with those. And of course, this is justified because we have real knowledge to believe that these two bodies are leading to sin. Who can doubt that the synodal way is leading to sin and innovations in the morality of the church? Who can doubt that the curia is going in a wayward direction the way Pope Francis has stocked it full of godless heathen United Nations bureaucrats? Do these people have the grace of infallibility? That is extremely doubtful. So what you are doing here is you are offering resistance consistent with the verses that you have here. Sometimes an arm of a body will refuse to do what the brain or will tells it to do. It is too ashamed to extend its hand to some terrible, disgusting, sinful object. In the same way, that is what we're doing here. We're offering a measured amount of resistance, not just through the curia, but even through the means of canon law. Feel free to not cooperate. If I were a bishop, I would not cooperate with canon law in multiple ways. It would be a testimony to Peter that the body of Christ inadvertently resists when directed towards sin. Paul withstood him to his face. Why? Because he was condemned. Who can doubt that Peter stands condemned today? And sometimes there are people in the leadership apparatus of the church who are not believers at all and are false apostles. 
they're not really sent by God, but are sent by some wayward tendency that has slipped into the body of Christ. And who can doubt that the Synodal Way and the Curia are stocked with people who are leading to sin, who would like to alter and change the immutable, perpetual moral beliefs of the church? So what are we supposed to do under that circumstances? We are supposed to contend for the faith, as Jude says. And that means that oftentimes you offer resistance. The body is not always cooperative with what the brain and the will tells it what to do. In the same way, this is how the bishops should offer resistance and not tolerate false apostles, either in the curia or in the suddenly appointed synodal way, or even, therefore, in the ways that they operate, namely canon law itself. If I were a bishop, I would just be discooperative with the pope. This is the principle that one always has the right to not do sin and to say no and to take the morally safer course. So if there is a logical argument that it would be morally safer to not do what the Pope says, then that perfectly justifies discooperation with him. So passive resistance is the way to go. And if necessary, you might have to supplement with another law to make up for the things that you're not relying on the papal curia for. So, but the goal, of course, is always, is not to separate, but just to wait out the papacy until it ends and another one begins, or until the Pope repents and grace and sanity returns to the See of Peter. Then at that time, then you can undo your law and return to business as usual. But in the meantime, this is your sacred duty as an anointed king to save your people from the evil that is coming from above. If you had been acting like kings, then you'd have no abuse cover-up because you could instantly sack a bad cleric and not have to go through the protocol of the curia. Therefore, you'd have no abuse crisis. You'd also have no priest shortage as young men would be deeply attracted to a charismatic bishop as we have seen in places like Arlington and Lincoln, Nebraska. Therefore, you'd have no gay pipelines and no gay cabals taking over whole seminaries. Lastly, you'd have no sexual revolutions, because in ruling firmly your curia, they too would rule the people. So these are the two choices that you have presented to you. Do not go with the one on the left. That has a special use only. Your default has to be the one on the right. On the left, listening, dialogue, and discernment is used for the magisterium hammering out dogmas under the guidance of the Holy Spirit. But that's not what you're doing. You're just administering a local diocese, ha hammering out your own policy under your own spirit. For that, you need Episcopal, spousal, really kingly leadership to see your diocese as your wife and to do whatever it takes to sanctify her. So feel free to chuck canon law. You don't need it. It's not revealed the way your kingship is revealed. Therefore, by the power of your kingship, you can suspend or even totally abrogate canon law at any time for anyone. Similarly, chuck collegialism. Abandon the USCCB. There's no need that you need to go at a snail's pace over a single issue. Treat your diocese like a wife and act decisively, quickly, and effectively to upbuild the people of God. If anybody questions why you're doing these things, remind them that the charity of the Holy Spirit is the soul of the church and manifest to them that your actions are motivated by charity, not by any kind of separatism or rebellion. Secondly, therefore, your attitude up until now has been insufficiently negative. Let me explain why this is so important. Negativity defines a people. The faith comes into an environment of darkness, darkness infused by the devil. The proper response to this is negativity, but not just one, rather two types. There should be repugnant negativity, which is what you would normally expect, but then there should be an also a cautionary negativity, identifying what is the minimal, bare minimum acceptable standard that Christians must remain inside of. Now, definition is by what something isn't. If you only have repugnant negativity, which is means that you are just lashing out at the evil out there in the world, then people are going to have a vague identity of what it means to be a Christian. They'll know it's not that, but they won't have a personal self-identity. For that, you need 
cautionary negativity where you make explicitly clear how far it is permissible to go. When you have these two things, that's when a group obtains a very firm identity and knows exactly what it means to be a Catholic. So increase the repugnant negativity and also include cautionary negativity. In scriptural terms, this means that you need to be not just Jesus, but John the Baptist. The Baptist was a burning and shining light, and people rejoiced in his world-rejecting light, while the true light that enlightens all men was still as yet only coming into the world. If salt has lost its taste, its identity, what is it good for except to be thrown out into outer darkness? As John the Baptist, you need to be exhorting people, you need to be rebuking the leaders, and you need to be absolutely unrepentant even to the point of having your own heads chopped off. You are not trying to win a popularity contest. Similarly, you must be salt, not the lukewarmness of Sardis, but a caustic burning that exposes exactly where the evil is, cutting between good and evil like a two-edged sword. In historical lesson, Waves of alternating rigidity and laxidity come and go, often caused by various wars. We had World War II, which was then counterbalanced by the relief and hope of Vatican II. Then we should have had some rigidity to counterbalance that and slow down the wild and craziness. We didn't. This resulted in the sexual revolution. The balance went out of whack. Then we had the Cold War. And we had the relief of John Paul II. We should have had some rigidity to counterbalance. And we did. His moral rigidity in encyclicals like Veritatis Splendor and Humani Vitae, which was based on his book Love and Responsibility. So the era of John Paul II was an era of great joy and fruitful, balanced growth with both freedom and law. Then we had the War on Terror, which is balanced by the relief of Francis. And we should have some rigidity to balance off the, the wild and craziness, but we don't. And therefore now we're getting the Marxist and gay pride movements. This is why you need negativity or rigidity to counterbalance the moral and social anarchic tendencies of the world. Look at your enemies. They have negative and positive aspects, both the rod and a staff. And they have many fruits in the, both these areas. As the rod, they have, on the communist side, racial warfare, national shaming, rioting, reparations demands. On the eco side, they have pandemic warfare, arguably. They have false eschatology. They even have liberation theology, whipping up rebel rebellions, and other fruits that are not particularly negative. On the positive side, they have many things pulling the, the people of the world in their direction. And with both a rod and a staff, you can bet that the world is heading with them to perdition. So to conclude, you need a change of attitude that is far more negative and condemnatory, separating out the way of the church from the way of the world. Lastly, you need a new direction, and first of all in the realm of morals, to focus less on abortion and instead on contraception. A parable. A man had two sons. He said to his sons, Go out into my field and bring forth fruits of repentance from porn and contraception. The good son went out into the field and labored all day helping the hired field hands bring forth fruits of repentance from abortion. The bad son went away and squandered all his wealth in a far-off country until he was literally serving LGBTQ and communist pigs. The good son said to his father, Father, you told me to bring forth fruits of repentance from porn and contraception. See, I have helped others bring forth tenfold more repentance from abortion instead. Then the harvest came, and everyone immediately starved, because nobody had brought forth any fruits of repentance from porn and contraception. So they appointed a different father, who would better serve LGBTQ and communist pigs. You are the Church of Sardis. You have the name of being alive, pro-life, and yet you are dead to the tune of 98% of your adults using the mortal sin of contraception. You have no physical people and no rational clue, but the mere reputation of being sensately lively. 
strengthen that which is on the point of death. And if you want to know more about this model of doing systematic theology, then go look at my Mysterium Fidei video on my YouTube channel. So what direction should we go in then? First, the wrong direction. Total permissivity. Anarchy. Anything goes. And why? Because it is the duty of the bishops to promote and safeguard the discipline common to the whole church. Even your own Vatican II, which we will repudiate later, knew this. And you should have changed long ago, 70 years ago. The night is far spent. It's too late. The cup is overflowing. You should have done something in the time of Margaret Sanger and come out extremely forcefully. You should have done something in the time of JFK in his infamous Hyannisport conference when he said, contrary to the Pope, papal statements of the 19th century, uh, that it was okay to have a separate opinion in your public and private life, supporting abortion openly but secretly cons considering it a sin. And then you certainly should have excommunicated Bill Brennan, who gave the Roe v. Wade decision. And then you did nothing about Sotomayor trying to stop Texas, or Pelosi, or Cruella. And so now what do you have? You are left with the number one man in the nation with the scandal that he's a blubbering idiot and you spend an entire conference deciding whether to even start to do something. For shame! How can you even consider yourself bishops, kings? The enemy holds the citadel of the whole country. The devil owns your number one guy. And really, the battle wasn't even about any of that anyways. The real battle all along was about contraception, because that's where the souls are lost. You should have done something about the Anglican Lambeth Conference and just lambasted the Anglicans to no end. You should have done something in the 60s about free love rather than coming out with hope in the spirit of Vatican II. You should have done something when all the theologians of contraception entered the major universities and built up huge names and followings for themselves. And you should have done something when 90% of the Catholic women in the world started using it, thinking that it was certainly fine, okay, because nobody ever preaches on it from the pulpit. So what do you have? After all this free pleasuring, now other people want to pre freely pleasure themselves too, and you don't know what to say about it, because you didn't do the first four dominoes that you should have stopped. So now we're left with gay pride as a right to pleasure, or the celebration of wanton moral anarchy, also known as licentiousness. Yes, you do need to preach humani vitae, and Leo XIII says it shouldn't matter that a doctrine is not opportune, not politically correct. You are to preach the word in season and out of season. Teach, rebuke, and win some, as 1 Timothy says. Furthermore, you are under no circumstances to permit any Democrat politician to have separate public and private stances on abortion. So your direction needs to be to take out contraception, painful as it may be. Next. Your direction needs to attack Americanism. And beyond that, I will get into something even beyond Americanism that you will help you to take out Americanism. But for the moment, we need a little historical perspective. In the 19th century, we had the French Revolution. And the papacy condemned that for its ideas of freedom of religion, separation of church and state, public education, even things like freedom of the press and freedom of speech. It said that such things should be regulated um, for the moral good of the community. It's basically what Facebook does right now. And, and furthermore, it added that no Catholics should be supporting evil on their political platforms. Well, this created a problem in pluralistic societies because to survive in a pluralistic political environment like a legislature, you need to bargain and make concessions, and no Catholic could do that. So it basically meant that Catholics needed to either rise above or below the fray, either go for monarchy, like in the Oster Habsburg Empire, or be a mob boss, like we had in the United States. The former ruling righteously, without concern for evil people. The latter ruling through and with evil people. This inability of Catholics to operate in a pluralistic legislative life resulted in tribalism then. As European monarchies accelerated externally into nationalism, and mob bosses accelerated internally into criminal turf wars. The turf wars didn't matter so much, 
but the nationalism resulted directly in World War I, which was the utter repudiation of monarchy throughout Europe. So that basically ended half the Catholic political impetus of the 19th century at the hands of the communists and Woodrow Wilson. That left Catholics who already had large illegitimacy politically with even less political legitimacy, which meant that all the conservatives and monarchists who had lost their legitimacy now went for the next best thing, which was the Franco-American model of separation of church and state. And they got Vatican II to approve their change. And they based it on human dignity, where the idea was you should embrace dignified Protestants, which seemed fine on the surface of it, but it left out a key thing that all that really matters is the dignity of those who are good, not the dignity of those who are going after sin. So the result was that quickly alighted the spirit of Vatican II, taking off, spreading the gospel of dignity into the dignity of those who contracept and the dignity who those who engage in creative sex and the dignity of those who dissent from the law of the church. And so now in the 21st century, the spirit of Vatican II really means secular dignity, that everyone has dignity. So yes, those dignified Protestants became dignified converts, but we've also got dignified cheaters and perverts and traitors, all claiming that because of their dignity, they deserve your inclusion. Well, along came cancel culture and looked at the good people and said, undignify them to cancel them. So here you are left standing. What should be your response to this situation? Take a page out of cancel culture's playbook and undignify those who are breaking the law of the church. This is the correct option. If you do this, then they will be canceled and they will not come to church, not that they have ever did, then they will be canceled and cease to call themselves Catholic and everyone will know what the word Catholic means. Because ultimately it wasn't about dignity at all. It was about the Holy Spirit's care for the life of the maturing wheat, lest the harvester should accidentally pull up the good with the bad. But, but the Holy Spirit has absolutely no concern for the weeds who are dead to it and whom God will throw into everlasting fire at the end of time. So reject the spirit of Vatican II and its idea of secular universal dignity. Be negative instead. This means that you will, of course, have to condemn dignitatis humanae. And there are plenty of errors in that document that are very easy to condemn, based on scripture and based on the writings of the 19th century popes. Here are some more errors. Ultimately, your soundbite to the world is going to have to be that you were engaging in an experiment with Vatican II, opening up their restrictions, but that judging from its fruits, at least within the first world, within America, the endeavor of the Second Vatican Council as a pastoral council has utterly failed owing to the recent degeneracy of mankind. So therefore, Americanism has to be your first target in the realm of faith. But not just Americanism, because we're in fact far beyond Amer Americanism. You can't just condemn Americanism anyways. That would be utterly rejected in America. But if you present it as an experiment, one that failed, then by connecting Americanism to the much more evident USA of Babylon, you can demonstrate to the world how not just the branch, but the root itself was erroneous. But for that, you would have to first clean up your house. You harbor Babylon. Look at it. There are two churches in America today. There's this, and then there's that. And you know which one the Sea of Peter favors. So first, you have to make clean up your house and make it look like this. Focusing on values that are not the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, 1 John 2.16, but that are focusing on prayer, fasting, and almsgiving, and that are not the glitzy attraction of the world. 
Only then will you be able to go with integrity to attack Babylon in the American culture. Because if you do not attack Babylon in the American culture, then you will have no converts, or even if you do, you will just be bettering them for the, to be members of the flock doomed to slaughter, as the prophet Zechariah said. 98% use contraception. So, make the USA of Babylon your objective in the coming century. And if you're slight and slow to do that, remember that your enemies are not slow, and they are leading and pulling in a certain direction. And the best defense is a really good offense. So, what spirit not to follow? Don't follow Pope Francis. Rather, publicly rebuke him. And you can even use these 12 items if you wish. There are many more that you could add. Who else not to follow? Well, beyond Pope Francis, you don't want to be following Bernardine or John Courtney Murray. Why? Because you will know a tree by its fruits. Pope Francis leads to the fruits of celebrityism, like this girl who calls herself Catholic even as she keeps raw porn on her Instagram channel. Or like this bishop who lends his mitre to celebrity women to dress up in blasphemous Hollywood church mocking balls and stands in the row with the Rockettes so that he can flaunt how thoroughly he has discarded the dress codes of the early 20th century. Neither is Father James Martin an apostle, nor his surrogates, the papal handpicks who help his faction of evildoers to rise through the hierarchy. Neither are you to follow John Courtney Murray, or his offspring JFK, or now Biden, or the bishop who enables him, even while condemning the most pro-life president in history, who paid tribute at the JP2 shrine and in front of churches and to Jesus Christ with the Merry Christmas message that was so scandalous in Washington, merely because he is a Democrat rather than a Republican. So do you want to know who the true prophets and apostles are upon which the church is built? St. Fulton Sheen and those who are sanctifying the airways in his way. The latter one having made a few terrible gaffes there. Michael Voris and Cardinal Vigano, the incorruptible cardinal whom you discarded and chased into hiding. Jason Everd, who actually takes the gospel to the youth. Father Ripperger and Mel Gibson, who teach us about the hidden things that we wouldn't have known about the faith. And Justice Scalia, the, the closest thing we've got to a moralizing political ethic that would be worthy of the 19th century popes. So I ask you, which of these two sides bore good fruits? These four serve Jezebel, this future mother of the Antichrist. These five serve the beast and the harlot that rides upon her, world government. And two of them, buried there in the fray, they actually serve the devil himself. On the other side, these three served the word of God by their message. These four served the church by their energy. And two of them served the Lamb of God by teaching us what it means to suffer and be expelled and sacrificed. Just in case you want to know, these six ideas are the six final beasts from the eschatology of the book of Revelation. They correspond to the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life and their antidotes, fasting, prayer, and almsgiving. When you want to determine whether a spirit is a good one or a bad one, you think about whether it is conducive to one of these entities. So you need to have a mindset and communicate a message that covers not just Americanism, but is an apocalyptic mindset that forces the faithful to focus on the future and who they will stand for. Will they be on Mount Zion with the Lamb, or will they be charging at them through the Valley of Jehoshaphat? Multitudes upon multitudes in the Valley of Decision. Where will you be? So then, what's to be done? The three R's, resignation, repudiation, and restoration. First, resignation. Are you compromised? Are you blackmailable? Are you beholden to someone or something? Do you have massive skeletons in the closet as a scandal waiting to blow? Please resign. Are you too jolly, too depressed, or bewildered 
to rebuke and command like a father. Please resign. Are you hi a hired hand, not willing to pursue wolves or, and take damage if necessary, and even give his life for the sheep? Please resign. Are you a political or financial appointee? Please resign. Are you a follower rather than a leader? Please resign. Are you visionless? Y you too, please resign. Next, repudiation. The two biggest enemies that you need to start by repudiating to the shock and horror of the world will be Pope Francis, that gay-friendly eco-communist, and the Democrat Party, the party of Moloch, Jezebel, Mao, and the future beast. Again, you know what you can rebuke Pope Francis for. You need to condemn the Democrat Party for these things, five of which are clearly excommunicable. Moving on from there, you need to take out Dignitatis Humanae. This is the spirit of Vatican II. And if you take it out here in America, the leader of all the countries of the world and the church, then surely the German bishops and the Pope will stop in their tracks. Maybe even the whole church will be turned to the, in the right direction, the way that we were back in the 50s and 60s. Here are some further points to take out Dignitatis Humanae. You might elect to just censure Dignitatis Humanae rather than full-on condemn it. And there's the May soundbite. You should also condemn the spirit of Vatican II for exuberant excesses far beyond the measure of faith and the rule of the law of the church. Lastly, you need to somehow communicate a vision to the American people of what a Christian and indeed Catholic democracy of America would look like. The future belongs to those who communicate a realistic vision. Right now, America is falling apart. Half the people think that the country should be abolished and split into two. If you let them know where we've gone wrong, focusing on the Babylon character of America and pointing to the root cause of it, then maybe we can have some serious constitutional amendment level change. Of course, such is not very likely. So a better first step would be to follow the will of the founders of our country, which was that there should have established churches in each of the separate colonies, the separate states. Of course, this was banished by the Virginia Statute of Religious Freedom and by the 14th Amendment. But there is no reason why you cannot make the case from the ground up that first localities, then states, should be able to come out op openly bearing tribute to one or another faith. People can get up and move and vote if they don't like it. Fragmentation like that would surely be better than the pursuit which the Pope is indicating that we should all unite in one massive world government where good and evil, God and Satan, are all in the general mix. Remember what scripture and the book of Daniel says, And the kingdom and dominion and the greatness of the kingdoms under the whole heaven shall be given to the people of the saints of the Most High. Their kingdom shall be an everlasting kingdom, and all dominions shall serve and obey them. So after resignation and repudiation, then your future, your focus has to be on restoration of the West and of America as a Christian, indeed Catholic country. We want something like this, not that.